Uh, all right, so this is a, a particular and interesting um, section of chemistry. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, universities and colleges uh, have their own course in inorganic chemistry, and this is a large portion of that course. So, you know, general chemistry is just a survey of a lot of specific disciplines um, that you can later on uh, study in much more detail. Um, all right, so what we need to do is we need to go through some new definitions and try to connect those um, new concepts and definitions with some of the things that, that you know from Chem 200. Uh, so <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at mainly in this uh, chapter are what's called coordination compounds or metal complexes. And they are thought to come about from a particular type of bond. Um, and, and it's a covalent bond because there's a sharing of electrons. <clears throat> uh, and so I think maybe it's worth uh, for you guys to uh, go back to Chem 200 a little bit and study uh, some Lewis structures, right? So you remember what the Lewis structures are, for example, uh, oxygen uh, has this type of a Lewis structure where you have two lone pairs and then two um, unpaired electrons. Uh, nitrogen kind of looks like this and so forth. Uh, so maybe a, a little review of uh, Lewis structures uh, is in order. Um, now in these complexes, the, um, the interaction is said to be a Lewis acid base type interaction. So we, we studied um, acids and bases from Arrhenius's perspective. You mostly did that in Chem 200. Then Bronsted-Lowry, we looked at where it centered on the, a proton, accepting a proton or donating a proton. Well, Lewis' definition of acids and bases, an acid is something that accepts a pair of uh, electrons, um, and a base is one that donates uh, a pair of an electron. <clears throat> so these examples right here, oxygen and nitrogen, they have lone pairs of electrons. And you can see them. there's the nitrogen lone pair. Oxygen has two lone pairs, uh, which uh, one of those lone pairs can be donated um, into an empty d orbital that resides on a metal. And then those electrons are shared. So together, that metal and what's called the ligands, that's these bases. These bases are also called ligands. Um, that makes up the coordination sphere. So the ligands and the metal make up the coordination sphere. Now the metal that forms this special bond called the coordinate covalent bond, um, it, it's usually a cation because cations are positively charged and you can imagine that they would be attracting electrons or lone pairs of electrons. Uh, but sometimes the metal can be neutral. Um, and, uh, and so we're gonna look at all those different possible uh, complexes. Uh, here's some examples down here where we have silver as the, the metal and the ligand is the ammonia. Now, um, you can imagine that nitrogen in ammonia looks something like this, right? Now, what's the difference between a coordinate covalent bond and a regular uh, covalent bond? Uh, you know from Chem 200 that a covalent bond comes, 
comes about through a um, an interaction between two atoms um, <clears throat> where an electron that resides on one atom comes together with the other atom and it's one electron and then they share those two in a bonding uh, arrangement. That's a covalent bond. Uh, now, in a coordinate covalent bond, there's still a pair of electrons that are shared, but the shared electrons originate, both of them, both electrons originate on the ligand. So this is the, the pair of electrons on ammonia that's shared in this coordinate covalent bond with silver. And you see there's two ammonia molecules or two ammonia bases, <clears throat> um, or what's called uh, two ammonia ligands. So all of those names are used interchangeably, interchangeably for the ligand. You have the metal now um, that we think of, at least through Chem 200, uh, as something that doesn't really want electrons. Uh, so metals are, are not very uh, electronegative, but what these metals have uh, are empty d orbitals. So uh, silver, if you look at the periodic table, these guys have empty d orbitals uh, and they can accommodate pairs of electrons. And since they're most of the time positively charged, you can see and you can rationalize why there would be an attractive interaction between a positively charged metal ion and these, uh, these bases with lone pairs of electrons. <clears throat> uh, all right, so uh, any, uh, the other things that might be interesting here on this plate to remember is that oftentimes the complex ion is uh, denoted uh, by placing that complex ion in brackets with the charge of the ion on the outside. So you see this complex is not charged, whereas this complex over here is. All righty, um, if there's no questions, then we'll take those definitions and move on. <clears throat> All right, now we have ligands that can be um, anions, and oftentimes they are anions, uh, like, for example, uh, the halogens, like F uh, minus, Cl minus, and so forth, uh, they're anions. So their Lewis structures are going to look like that. And <clears throat> any one of these lone pairs of electrons can be don donated into empty d orbitals on a metal and form this Lewis acid base interaction uh, or this coordinate covalent bond. Now, when this takes place, this modifies the behavior of the metal. So it doesn't act um, usually like anything like it did before without these uh, bonds to it. <clears throat> For example, we just studied electrochemistry. So this example down here illustrates how uh, this interaction changes physical and chemical properties of the metal. So in this, this first equation here, we see the reduction of silver, and we know it's reduction potential. We can look it up. Now, if we have silver engaged in some sort of a coordinate covalent bond, say with cyanide, which is another example of a negatively charged uh, ligand, <clears throat> uh, you, you see that the reduction potential changes drastically. Uh, and down here we note that this is also the case, you know, why we're here, that even though before when we talked about copper and silver ions in water and just about all those other metal ions, cobalt, and chromium, 
that you might find in water, aqueous, um, they really don't exist all by themselves floating around in water. They, they have these coordinate covalent compounds um, with water. So if we look at the Lewis structure of water, you see that that oxygen has two lone pairs. And one of these lone pairs can be donated into empty d orbitals and then shared with some metal. And uh, in fact, for silver, there's six of those water molecules that form a, a, a complex um, and the, the sphere, the, um, the metal and the ligands um, make up that complex sphere. And in, in the case of silver, there's six water molecules that form six coordinate covalent bonds. And, and we're just introducing this now. We're gonna take a, a look at pictures in a little bit uh, to hopefully make this a little less um, foggy or, or theoretical. <clears throat> All right, so the charge on the complex equals the sum of the metal and the ligand charges. This is no different than the summation rules that we looked at uh, when we were assigning oxidation states. So I have a little note to do the iron example. So for uh, that one lab that you did, the complex uh, or that green crystal, right? This was the green crystal. It, its formula was this. All right, so the complex is in the brackets. And I know what the charge of the complex is. Does, does anybody know what the charge of this would have to be according to those summation rules for oxidation states? Any guesses? All right. Negative well, six. Okay, good, close. Um, now, we have to remember those summation rules. So uh, what is the charge on the potassium? I'm sorry, it's a uh, potassium has a plus one charge. So it would be mm -hmm. negative three. Yeah, you're right. So it's plus one and there's three of them. So that gave up three electrons. The water is neutral. And besides, that's not even in the crystal. Well, I mean, it's not in the crystal lattice itself, but when this solid forms, water gets trapped in there. And so this just tells you how much water is trapped in there. It's like a hydrate. So if we heated it, presumably it would just go off and maybe change color of the, uh, the, the crystal. But uh, back to assigning the oxidation states. So since potassium uh, is plus one and there's three, that's three electrons it gave up. And so that means that that iron complex, you're right, that iron complex has to be negative three. And, and that's something we already learned. We learned how to assign oxidation numbers and stuff like that. So we can go through here and do that, assign the oxidation numbers and make sure they add up to minus three. Now, I see that C2O4, that's the oxalate um, ion. And in this context, we recognize it as a ligand and it's um, making coordinate covalent bonds with iron. And I also know, because I can look up C2O4 and find out its charge, I know that it's a, a negative two um, polyatomic ion. So there's three of them. So that's minus six in there. Uh, and I know the total has to equal a negative three. So the charge on iron has to be a plus three. Okay. Um, all right, so 
you know, you're right, the, the iron was plus three. Uh, this, we, I think we already talked about. Now the coordination number is defined here and it's defined as the number of pairs of electrons that are uh, donated by the ligands. Uh, and it also equals the number of coordination covalent bonds, but not necessarily the number of ligands, okay? And that's because uh, ligands can donate sometimes more than one pair of electrons. For example, uh, if we go back and we look at our ammonia um, ligand, then that only has one lone pair of electrons to donate. So it can only make one coordinate covalent bond, right? Um, and we call that monodentate. We'll see why later. Uh, as opposed to something like uh, the carbon uh, oxalate, where we have a structure that looks something like this. And it turns out that uh, in this case, uh, two of the oxygens can, oops, uh, donate their lone pairs of electrons to whatever metal that they're binding to, say the iron. Uh, and this would be considered a bidentate ligand. So uh, we have to uh, be able to recognize when we're dealing with a monodentate uh, ligand with a bidentate. And we'll get more on that a little bit later. But anyway, the coordination number, that equals the number of coordinate covalent bonds, but not necessarily the number of ligands because you can have uh, what's called polydentate ligands. More than one lone pair of electrons can be used. All right, so that, that's um, some more definitions. Uh, here we have some 3D pictures, which is kind of nice. So uh, I have here the cobalt uh, coordinate covalent bond with six monodentate uh, ammonias. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we know from uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory in chem 200 that when you have six ligands in this case it's going to form what we call uh, back then an octahedral complex or an octahedral geometry so you might say well geez that that sounds weird because in this you know we're saying it has six ligands um, and then we call this complex octahedral now, what the octahedral refers to is eight sides. And that's what, uh, what happens if you look at like the 3D picture of what's happening here. You can imagine that there's a pyramid uh, on the top of the plane of the cobalt here, right? So you have a pyramid on the top and then one on the bottom. And each one of these pyramids have four sides. So there's one here, two, um, three over here, and four here. Each one has four sides and um, you add them up and it's eight. So that's where the, the name octahedral comes from. Okay. Uh, and, and as usual, if there's any questions, just go ahead and and blurt them out. No. Thanks for <clears throat> Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for clarifying that. That's always confused me, but now it makes sense why there's the octa for the eight side. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it's really weird. Usually chemistry has it uh, on point when it comes to naming things and they make sense, uh, but this one's a little weird. So, uh, all right. So uh, now this looks at cobalt. Now, cobalt metal ions are almost always three plus, and so are chromium metal, almost always. If you had to guess, you would guess that these ions are gonna be three plus, 
And that's not always true, but if you had to, that's what you should do. Uh, all right, and the complex again here, like when we wrote it out in the molecular form, uh, it is encased in these brackets and the charge is typically put on the outside of the brackets to indicate the charge of the overall complex. All right. Um, now, why do some complexes have two ligands, some have um, four and some have six? Well, there's a lot of different reasons, but two of the main reasons, the, the, the ones that you can um, know because you'll, you might be tested on these uh, are one, the size of the ligands and two, the amount of electrons transferred in that coordinate covalent bond. So, you know, uh, and this might seem a little weird, the amount of, of charge transfer, charge transferred, but that's just the amount of electrons in a bond. So say you have some metal and it's forming um, a coordinate covalent bond with a ligand. So I'll put an L there for the ligand that donates the pair of electrons. You know that that's not gonna be uh, shared. Those pair, that pair of electrons in here are not gonna be shared equally. Uh, in fact, since the metal is less electronegative, you're, you're expecting that most of the electron pair is going to go to the ligand and less to the metal. Uh, but how much? How much is going to be shared? That depends on the identity of the ligand, as we'll see. So some ligands are very electron rich, like cyanide, CN. It's the end that, that has the lone pair of electrons. And this, this ligand is also negatively charged. So it's electron rich. It has a lot of electrons. So it's probably gonna take less of the share uh, in that, um, that coordinate covalent bond as opposed to ammonia where you have um, nitrogen all by itself with three hydrogens with, and it's not charged. So this nitrogen is gonna want more of that uh, lone pair of electrons than this guy was, because it already has an extra electron. Uh, so for this example, because of the amount of electrons that are shared in that um, coordinate covalent bond is different, then you could have different amounts of ligands that can exist in the complex. For example, uh, nickel uses six ammonias to, to fit into their empty D orbitals because there's less electrons that are being donated by the ammonia than cyanide. Cyanide, you can only fit four because it's really juicy, really rich in electrons and it fills up the available d orbitals that nickel is willing to use. So the amount of charge transfer uh, is one of those criterion that uh, dictates how many ligands you can have. Now, the other thing that we're gonna look at is size. That's not as, as uh, intricate, I don't think, as the charge transfer one size, it's just a matter of how many can fit comfortably, how many ligands can fit comfortably uh, around that metal ion to make the coordination sphere. And remember the definition of coordination sphere, that's just, you know, the, the metal and all the ligands. So here we have an example of iron, and it's going to form um, coordinate covalent uh, bonds with uh, chloride, which is gonna have all four lone pairs versus fluoride. Uh, and these are uh, negative ions. So I guess I should change this. This should be Cl minus. That's what uh, we're talking about here. And this should be F minus. 
Uh, anyway, F, the fluoride is going to be much smaller uh, physically than chloride. You know, chloride, you go down a whole row and, and add in a whole bunch of D electrons, and it's just a lot bigger than the fluoride. So for iron, you can fit six of the smaller fluorides around that iron comfortably, and they won't bump into each other and cause uh, repulsion. Uh, whereas uh, for chloride, you can only fit four of those chloride atoms comfortably around the iron. So we, we sometimes refer to this kind of an effect. It's called steric effect. It just, just means, you know, the geometry is such that there's uh, less bumping. Uh, so these are two of the, the reasons, but there's many others, many others uh, that dictate the size of the coordination sphere. You know, am I dealing with six ligands, four ligands, two ligands? Uh, and if you had to um, rationalize why some are one way or another, you can use uh, one or two of these uh, reasons. All righty, any questions on that? Okay, good. Now we have uh, other geometries as well that are possible, not just octahedral. For example, tetrahedral. It turns out that D8 metals uh, are the, the ones that tend to form tetrahedral uh, complexes. So if you looked at the periodic table, you would see where zinc was. Uh, and, and that's not so much a D8 uh, metal, but platinum is. So platinum uh, being D8, that tends to form, uh, I'm sorry, the D8s tend to form square planar. Uh, zinc is not a D8, so that forms a tetrahedral. And here, tetra refers again to the sides uh, uh, of the geometry. So we have, you know, four sides. Okay. Square planar, platinum, and any other D8s. So let me see, what's under platinum? I think it's palladium. That's above, yeah. So palladium PD is also uh, one of those metals that tend to form uh, square planars. And down here, it's just a, a reminder of something that we talked about before that ammonia is a monodentate ligand. Okay. Now, polydentate ligands are, are very important in many applications uh, in medicine and uh, preservatives and so forth. For example, uh, this guy here is called ethylene diamine. Okay. This is uh, our first example, actually our second, we looked at oxalate before, uh, of polydentate ligand, more specifically, it's bidentate. So these are called chelating agents because they have um, more than one claw. That's what chelate uh, refers to. Uh, and that's just referring to the number of coordinate covalent bonds that they can form. So ethylene diamine can form two. It's a bidentate ligand. So it's in the category of polydentate, which is many teeth or many claws. That's what dentate refers to as teeth. Um, so we see here in this complex uh, pictured that the whole complex is a plus three charge and it has three ethylene diamine molecules in it. 
So there's three of them. And I can I can circle them here. Here's one. Here's two. And here's three. So there's three in there, but it's an octahedral structure because it has six coordinate covalent bonds. Uh, and you can see where those coordinate covalent bonds have to originate from, or at least what atom, and that's the nitrogen atom. There's two nitrogen atoms in ethylene diamine, and each one, remember, has that lone pair of electrons that's donated and then shared, forming a coordinate covalent uh, bond. Okay, any questions on that? Here are some other polydentate ligands, also called chelates. It depends on, you know, where you see it. it when it refers to medicine or foodstuffs, they call them chelates. Uh, in chemistry, you could call polydentates. Um, and so you'll see them interchanged, uh, but mostly chelating is, is used in organic chemistry. So they use that name a lot, but it's just the polydentate ligand. Here's the oxalate um, ion that we looked at already. Now, even though oxalate has four uh, oxygens and all the oxygens have lone pairs of electrons, it's still just bidentate, which means it makes only two coordinate covalent bonds because it's kind of a steric effect, you know, just the geometry. If you can imagine if I have the metal over here, then I can form a coordinate covalent bond here and here, but I can't form it over here, it's too far away. So it only has uh, two coordinate covalent bonds. And here you can imagine the metal being here, form a bond here and here in um, phenan, phenanthrolene. Uh, the carbonate ion, CO3, again, is a bidentate ligand. And remember, we just studied electrochemistry and we found that we can galvanize iron and that protects it because you put a coat of zinc on it and then the zinc is preferentially oxidized. So it's a sacrificial anode. And so it goes from zinc oxide to zinc hydroxide and then finally ends up with the zinc carbonate, which is a strong tough shell because of these coordinate covalent bonds. Um, which uh, tend to be true for any polydentate ligand. It just, uh, they make stronger interactions um, and they're harder to break the bonds. And we'll take a look at why. Uh, and again, here for uh, bipyridine, it's also a bidentate ligand. Uh, all right. Um, I don't know why all this stuff followed me here, but anyway, um, since these polydentate ligands uh, make strong bonds uh, with the metal, we call that the chelate effect. And chelate effect is good if, if you have a metal in a system and you wanna make strong bonds to it, then you're gonna want a, a polydentate ligand because of this chelate effect. And the chelate effect just says that um, if we look at the equilibrium constants for a metal uh, complex involving monodentate ligands like ammonia versus a complex involving polydentate ligands like ethylene diamine. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned that back here when we were looking at ethylene diamine. Uh, that's often abbreviated with the, the um, letters EN. But it's a bidentate ligand like we saw back here. And um, we have 
them interacting versus the ammonia interacting with nickel. And you can see the difference in the magnitude of the equilibrium constants, the KFs, the formation of the complex ions. Now remember, we looked at KFs before when we were looking at equilibrium, but we didn't get into uh, the structure of that complex ion. That's what we're doing now. But you can see the difference in the magnitude of the equilibrium constants, which says this equilibrium lies way to the right. Uh, this one does too, but not nearly as much. So this is what's called the, the chelate effect. Polydentate ligands tend to bind with higher equilibrium constants, just showing that they're more stable than monodentate complexes. And that's important if, for example, you want to get rid of poisons in a biological system. So say you have a metal that's... Um, not a good thing to have in, in your um, biological system, and you want to get rid of it. Uh, well, you would want it to bind or bond to uh, a chelate. So in medicine, chelates are used sometimes in poisoning of mercury or lead. You add a chelate such as ethylene diamine or um, this EDTA that we're gonna look at uh, really soon, and you'll see why uh, that can be used because it binds with the metal, and that way that metal can't uh, do any harm in the biological system because it has strong binds with this chelating agent. And then uh, hopefully it, it just goes out with the waste because it's non-interactive. Uh, all right. Here is that polydentate ligand that I was uh, talking about. This is an important chelating agent, and you'll see it in medicine. It's called EDTA. It's got a minus four charge. The EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetate. And this guy is a hexadentate ligand, which means that it makes six coordinate covalent bonds. So just one ligand makes six coordinate covalent bonds in an octahedral complex. And, and here's pictured this, this complex down here in the brackets has a negative one charge. Here's the metal in here. And the EDTA just surrounds the whole metal. So this is all the EDTA in here. Here's the formula of EDTA. And you can see that out of the eight oxygens that this EDTA has, four of them are involved in coordinate covalent bonds. One, two, three, four, and out of the two nitrogens, well, both of those form coordinate covalent bonds for five, six coordination number. You'll also find EDTA in your food. If you look at the, the ingredients of your Twinkies or whatever processed food, uh, mostly, they use this as a preservative because iron, uh, these things are processed in industry and there's lots of metal in their machines. And so iron shards get into your food, um, you know, small amounts. They add EDTA to your food to cause these hexadentate uh, complexes. This, using this hexadentate ligand, EDTA, uh, and therefore uh, get around the, the spoiling of your food because iron catalyzes the spoilage of uh, stuff that you eat. Okay. 
All right, any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, so check it out. If you look at your packages of food, you'll see uh, EDTA sometimes in there. And EDTA, it, it's an additive. And so you might see it uh, like, uh, I've seen it like this, Na4EDTA, because sodium is plus one, uh, that'll give you, when, when it dissolves, if there's any water, it'll give you your EDTA and sodium, which is fine. I, I've also seen it uh, calcium, uh, Na2, EDTA. Calcium has a plus two charge. And again, that'll give you the, the ion that you want. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, I've seen like EDTA and like dog ear cleaning solution. Uh -huh. I was wondering like, how does that? It must be, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but it must be the same thing. It must be as a preservative. So if any metal gets in there, uh, and metals will react with, I guess, the active ingredient in whatever it's put in. So they want to uh, make sure that if there's any dissolved metals in there, that they get bound up in these complexes. Remember, these make very strong uh, bonds because of the chelate effect. They have huge equilibrium constants. So once they're, they're reacted, they don't let go. And so whatever the other adverse reaction is with the product that you're buying, um, they get around that by uh, what, what they say, sequestering the metal. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. All right. Um, there we go. You find uh, these, th this type of interaction in biological organisms. Check out this poor, uh, it's called the porphine ring. And it looks kind of confusing here because you haven't had too much organic chemistry, but uh, this structure uses the, the, the way that uh, molecules are represented in organic chemistry. So whenever two lines meet, it's understood that there's a carbon atom there, okay? So these are all carbon atoms. And so I have a, a carbon double bond carbon here at the bottom. And then I have a single bond with another carbon over here, which means that there's one valency that's open. So it's understood, even though it's not written out here, that each one of these carbons has a hydrogen bonded to it. Now this guy right here, that has all four bonds taken. So there's no hydrogen on that carbon or this carbon, uh, but then this carbon has a hydrogen and so forth. So anyway, that's just a little prelude in the organic. So th that's what that represents, this porphine ring that's found uh, as we'll see in plants and animals, uh, you can see that its structure is such that a metal would fit really nicely right here and form four coordinate covalent bonds with the nitrogen. And when that metal is iron, uh, we'll find that in muscle tissue, blood tissue, that's called the heme group. When this metal here is magnesium, that's found in plants and it's called chlorophyll. There's a little note here, why is uh, carbon monoxide so poisonous then? Well, carbon monoxide, as you know, uh, has this structure, right? So carbon and I have a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen. That's the, the, the lone pair that forms the um, 
a coordinate covalent bond with say iron in your blood and it makes a, a relatively strong bond for example co2 is not as strong because the lone pair of electrons that's donated from co2 uh, that lone pair is, is shared less with the metal which makes it a, a weaker bond because I have two electronegative atoms here, whereas I only have one here. Uh, so the lone pair of electrons here is, is shared a little more equally and it makes that bond stronger. So once CO uh, bonds with say iron here, it, it's, it, it bonds with a stronger bond and it's less likely to let go. And that's not the way your body functions when it needs uh, oxygen. Oh yeah. Oxygen is another example. So not CO2, just oxygen in that case. Uh, here is a look of the porphine ring in um, myoglobin, it's muscle tissue. It's similar to hemoglobin, but the heme ring is that uh, ring that we just looked at, the, the four nitrogens in here in that ring making a bond with the iron. And then the iron makes another bond with the protein over here, and then makes another bond, and therefore six coordinate covalent bonds in octahedral complex with oxygen. So if CO gets in there, that makes a stronger bond than oxygen. Uh, and, and that's not good because then that site's blocked and oxygen can't, um, get passed through that biological organism and it dies. Uh, all right, this is just a recap on some of the stuff that we already talked about. So I'll let you read that. Um, this is the picture again of that heme group uh, illustrating the bond to the protein down here and it's carrying the oxygen uh, through the, the blood. Chlorophyll in plants is similar, except you replace the iron with magnesium ion. And then uh, chlorophyll does its stuff. It, it uh, absorbs light and converts CO2 to sugar. Also here, it says, this is kind of interesting. Uh, chlorophyll in plants usually absorb uh, red light and uh, blue light and therefore plants are green because as you know or, or may not know that um, the thing that you perceive color from um, that's the color that's not absorbed that's the color that's reflected and so a lot of things oftentimes look like they're complementary color. So whatever they absorb, they look uh, like the complementary color. If you remember the color wheel here, so I'll just try to draw a color wheel. I got red, orange, yellow, green, blue and violet. So if this plant is absorbing red, so that gets absorbed, it looks like the complementary color, which is the opposite on the color wheel, green. Uh, here's a, a, a bigger picture of chlorophyll. You have different chlorophyll A, B, and so forth. They differ in these side chains, uh, but the porphine ring is the same in all the chloroforms, or sorry, chlorophylls. And the last thing that we're gonna talk about today, and, and then I'll give you a little homework assignment, and that's uh, nomenclature, the naming of these complex ions. And you can kind of have fun with this. It's, you know, you had to name a, a whole bunch of 
uh, compounds in Chem 200, and you had to uh, worry about the the um, cations from the uh, non-metals, which tend to be anions and so forth, and you had all these different rules for nomenclature. Well, there's a whole different nomenclature system for these complexes. Uh, and essentially, it, it's outlined in the next few plates. But uh, anyway, we have this complex here. And sometimes you can have the complex as the cation in a salt. So this is the positively charged portion right here. And then this is the negatively uh, part of the, the salt, the chloride. Um, so if we pull it apart, we see that the complex uh, is the cation and it has a plus two charge. And so we name that before the anion, um, much like uh, this guy, aluminum oxide, right? Uh, two, three. Okay, so we just say to name that uh, salt or that ionic compound, it's an aluminum oxide. All right, so we'd have to name the cation before the anion uh, but you have to get familiar with the, the names of the things. So if we look down at this uh, salt, we name the cation, but we have to name these ligands in alphabetical order. And we also have to indicate how many of each ligands. So I know that this group here, this ammonia group is called amine. And that begins with the A, so we have to alphabetize our name. And chloro begins with the C, so that's next. So to name this, it would be pentaamine chlorocobalt three. You have to tell the charge, and then chloride. So this is aluminum oxide. This is something chloride because, well, that's the anion. So what follows is more um, details on nomenclature. Here are, uh, it's a small subset list of possible ligands, bases that are gonna donate those pairs of electrons to form the coordinate covalent bond. Here's a, a small list. Uh, you could memorize them um, or you could just look them up. Uh, and there'll be larger lists in, in your textbook. But most of the time, these ions are negatively charged. Not always. Sometimes they're neutral, like down here. All of these are neutral. And when they're negatively charged, usually we just change their name at, by adding an O at the end. So azide N3 minus becomes azido. Bromide is bromo, chloro, cyano, hydroxo, carbonato, oxalato. Uh, and then the neutrals are usually just their name. Like pyridine is just pyridine. But there are a few exceptions. Ethylene diamine is just ethylene diamine. Uh, the, the exceptions are ammonia which is one that you're going to use a lot, and water. For water, the name of the ligand is aqua, and for ammonia, it's amine. And Professor, I'm sorry, you said, so we have to memorize these for the exam? Well, you don't have to because it's, it's kind of an open book exam, right? And you have a day to do it. So... Um, you don't have to memorize them. They're, those ones are just ones that you're gonna probably, when you work through these, you're probably gonna end up memorizing anyway because they, they come up so often. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, so let's get back to, to naming these. Here's the, the details on 
the nomenclature. And, and if you look back at the stuff that you did in Chem 200, I think this is easier. Anyway, uh, when you name it, you always name the cation before the anion. That's something that you've done before, right? Like aluminum oxide. Um, so you have to name the, the cation first. And that complex can be either part of the cation or you can have a complex as part of the anion or you can have both. So you're gonna look at, uh, see a few examples of naming things uh, like that. But anyway, the Greek prefixes are gonna be used um, when the cation has multiple numbers of ligands. So if it has, Two ammonias, for example, it's di. If it has three ammonias, tri, and so forth. Uh, now, those prefixes don't come into the alphabetization. Oh, God, I can't say it. Alphabetization of um, the ordering. So remember, in that example back here, we had to alphabetize this amine came before the chloro because A comes before C, but the penta doesn't go into the alphabetization. So we don't use penta. We say amine is before chloro and that's it. So that comes first. So we, we say it's penta amine, then the chloro, then the metal and its charge. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's what it's saying over here. Now, if the ligand already has a Greek prefix, like di, tri, tetra, or something like that, then we go to a secondary uh, nomenclature system, a numbering. Uh, and that is this bis for when it's two, so instead of using di, you would use bis. Uh, tris is for three, tetrakis is for four, pentakis and hexakis. And since we never get more than six, um, then that's usually where we stop. For example, uh, and this is the only one that we looked at so far, ethylene diamine, the one that we abbreviated as EN, uh, ethylene diamine has a Greek prefix already in it. It's got di. So we have to go to this secondary numbering system and, and use tris for three instead of tri. Uh, and so that's the only tricky thing for naming the cation. All right, now, when we have a situation where um, the complex ion is negatively charged, like we do here in this example, again, we would name the cation first. So say uh, this complex was K2COCl4. We would say potassium first, right? Because the cation you name before the anion. And then you would name it the same way as you did for the, the um, complex when it's a cation, except the at the end, the metal has to end in an ATE ending. So here I have tetrachlorocobaltate two is the charge on cobalt. And I know uh, cobalt has to be a plus two charge because I have four um, chlorides and the total has to be a minus two. So that means the cobalt has to be plus two in this case. All right, now, uh, a lot of metals, you just have to add the ATE ending. But there's some metals that use an older nomenclature system, and it sounds better. Um, for example, 
if iron was part of the anion, you could put iron eight, but it sounds much better to use ferrate. And copper eight, I guess you can use that, but cuprate um, is often used instead. And for gold, orate, lead, plumate, argentinate for silver, and stannate for tin. So what I'm going to do is um, end class or our discussion now and have you guys uh, take a look at these as part of your uh, homework assignment. Now, this is also in Canvas in the um, area where you would look at your PowerPoint notes. There's this exercise. And so uh, in this exercise, I have one through eight of these metal complexes. Sometimes the complex is the cation, like it is here in the beginning examples. Uh, sometimes it's the anion, like I have here and here. Uh, and yeah, so, and sometimes it's charged where when you have the complex is charged, where you have the brackets, and sometimes the complex doesn't have a charge. Uh, all right. So uh, we'll take a look at a few of those. And then the exercise goes on and it says, okay, here are some names. Can you give the complex for those names? And then we go back to uh, trying to name these complexes. Now this one here has um, complexes for both the cation and the anion. Uh, and so you're gonna go ahead, try to name those and try to name them by going through the rules without peeking at the answers which are right down here. So you already have the answers to all of those, but you're gonna to try to learn how to apply those rules to come up with those answers. Uh, for example, let's just take uh, a look at a, a couple of these. Uh, so this first guy, you have to name alphabetically. So uh, it would be amine versus aqua. So amine comes first in the alphabet. So we'd have triamine, triaqua, chromium-3, chloride would be the first one. So I'm just applying those rules. I know that that's chromium-3 because I know this whole complex has to be plus three because of the charge on the chloride in the salt. So that has to be plus three. I know that this is neutral water and this is neutral ammonia, so that chromium has to carry all three plus charge. All right, um, so you're going to be doing that cation before the anion. Then this one here starts the other way around. We're going to have the complex in the anion. So this one would be potassium. You don't uh, worry about that subscript in salt, just like aluminum oxide. You don't worry about those subscripts, right? Aluminum oxide. Uh, so this, is, this would be potassium, hexacyano, ferrate, and the charge on iron is plus two. And I know it's plus two because it has to add up to zero. So I have a plus four from the potassiums, plus something from the iron, minus six equals zero. So this has to be a plus two. So you'll, you'll look at those and try them. And then you're going to try to come up with the structures given the name, hexaamine iron three nitrate. So uh, it's an iron complex and it has six ammonias. And it has nitrate, NO3. And I know the nitrate has a minus one charge. So I got to make sure that I have the right number of nitrates. I got to figure out these um, coefficients from the charges. 
So since iron's plus three and ammonia uh, is neutral, then this iron has to carry that whole plus three charge, which means this complex is plus three, which means I need three of those nitrates for the formula. So you're gonna be doing stuff like that and figuring out formulas and then checking them and going over it. Uh, and, and, you know, try to get through it. If you have any questions, then we can go over it tomorrow and continue our discussion uh, in this section. Uh, any questions? No? All right, then if there's no questions, then I'll, I'll wait till everyone leaves and then I'll log out. Thank you. Thank you guys.